but beginning to think about the pedestrian, the bike, um, the other uses of alternative transportation besides uh, just car. Um, so with that, I'm going to let uh, Councilman Wiggins uh, say his welcome and just to say again, thank you for being here and thank you for providing us your input. It is very valuable to us as we take that from where we go forward because Again, there will be things in here that you see that we haven't thought about. That's the whole purpose of coming forward here. Uh, we need your input and uh, we're gonna use that to incorporate into the final plan, but we thank you for being here to share with us. Thank you, Mayor. Council member. Uh, Lee, and you know, just to echo what the mayor has already said, you know, uh, just you know, you guys have done a great job, an amazing job. You have done so much already. And again, uh, just to have, you know, this type of mode of, of walkability and bikeability uh, in the downtown area and, you know, during this project, I think is great. And uh, again, with you and, you know, the rest of your team members who, who helped out with this program uh, during this process, again, y'all have done an amazing job and I'm excited about what you guys will uh, feature tonight. So, with that being said, you know, I'm looking forward to the presentation. And again, thank you so much for just allowing me the opportunity to, uh, you know, come on here and just to just to speak. So, again, thank you. And I'm looking forward to uh, the presentation. Thank you both for the warm welcome and for taking the time to join us. Um, before we start, a little bit about um, what we'll be discussing today. So um, that was our welcome. Um, we will provide a brief overview of where this project originated uh, as part of the Pensacola Waterfront Master uh, Framework Plan, uh, discuss the goals of the hashtag project in particular, and go over some of the comments the team received from the public uh, at the previous public meeting that was held in, back in February of last year. Um, we will then review examples of similar streetscape or complete street projects from other small or medium cities um, to see what we can learn from them, and then share the updated design of the project uh, that has been developed by the engineering firm Dewberry. Uh, we will have time for uh, maybe a few questions in the larger forum, but we hope to, at the end of um, our session today, to have more of an open discussion in small breakout groups. We found those to be generally more productive than your typical Q&A. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, we are recording the meeting, uh, and the recording will be available on the city's uh, website in case you have to leave early or if you want to share it with someone who wasn't able to attend today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, we encourage you to type them up in the chat. Uh, you'll see a little chat button uh, at the, either the top or the bottom of your screen. The chat goes directly to the meeting hosts, um, and we'll be able to respond uh, we probably won't be able to respond to all comments uh, on the spot, but we are recording all of the comments and questions as they go in, and they will help the engineering team develop the design further. Um, uh, we have muted all of the participants just to avoid any, you know, unanticipated background noises or audio issues, dogs barking at the, the usual Zoom phenomena. Um, so again, if there's anything that you would like to raise, please just type it in the chat. Uh, during the small group discussions, you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask questions more directly and more freely. Uh, uh, last thing before we start is I would like to introduce our uh, engineering and design team that you'll hear from today. So actually before that, not on this slide are, uh, as Mayor mentioned, David Forte, uh, who's been our project manager on the city side, and Helen Gibson, our uh, invaluable CRA uh, leader, um, who have been really shepherding the process, and we're extremely thankful for that. Um, Dewberry, as mentioned, are leading the design process. David Tiller is a project manager and um, lead engineer on the project. Garrett and Crystal are working with David uh, and will participate in the small group discussion. SCAPE is providing design advisory services, making sure that the design stays consistent with the principles that uh, were developed through the framework plan process and facilitating the community engagement. Uh, Gina Worth is our design principal, this is me, uh, and uh, Jessica and I are working with Gina on the project. 
Uh, we are also working with Angela Kyle and James and Yushang from uh, James Lima Planning and Development, who are assisting us with some of the community engagement and economic analysis on the project. So you'll hear from James and Yushang a, a little bit later today. So how did this all start? Uh, a couple of years ago, SCAPE was hired by Quint Studer and the city of Pensacola to develop a framework plan for the city's waterfront. Um, through that process, we met many of you and I'm, I'm excited to see some familiar faces and some uh, nice messages in the chat already. So thank you for that and for that special commitment that Pensacola seems to have to participating in these processes. Um, we, together with you, work to develop a plan that tries to really build on uh, and, and celebrate some of the unique assets and potentials along the city's waterfront. Um, as part of that project, we identified two catalytic projects, uh, projects that we thought would have the most impact and be able to kickstart the transformation of Pensacola's waterfront so that the city can really benefit from this wonderful resource. Um, and we're really excited that the city and the CRA were able to secure funding to implement these two projects. Um, so one of the catalytic projects was the downtown hashtag connector, uh, looking at these four streets. So Palafox, Jefferson, Main Street, and Bayfront that create this hashtag form uh, and recognizing that these are really a key to connecting downtown and the water through pedestrian and bicycle movement and hopefully new development and private investment as well. Um, what we're here to talk about today is the first phase of that project that centers along uh, the Main Street corridor. Um, the project goals for specifically for the hashtag that were identified, um, again, collaboratively as part of this engagement process, uh, include um, to create a walkable, bikeable, and safe environment, especially along Main Street, to connect people from the downtown areas, from, from the shops and cafes on Palafox, all the way down to the water, to acknowledge and celebrate the historic significance of this area and its maritime heritage, and to provide the setting and encourage infill development and retail along Main Street. So as we continue with the presentation, we would really like to ask you to think about these shared goals and let us know if you think that we're meeting them. Um, early last year, as, uh, as was mentioned, the city held a public meeting to share the first design draft for this project. Many of you shared your thoughts, your comments, and those were really instrumental in how the design has changed since. Um, the points that were raised fell into two broad categories, streetscape design, so things like uh, thinking about safety, walkability, biking, uh, parking, and inclusivity, uh, emphasizing the connection between East and West, Pensacola along the waterfront, uh, and connecting to the waterfront. So these are just a few of the examples uh, of some of the things that we've heard and uh, were collected. Uh, comments that call their attention to lane widths, for example, to the importance of maintaining a certain number, a number of parking spots, uh, the importance of stormwater management to this area in particular, and overall, just the, the general relevance of, of these projects to the city's future. Um, you also talked about uh, safe crossings for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, the physical protection of bicycle lanes, and where exactly within the streetscape those bike lanes should be located. Um, and then finally, we heard about, again, the importance of connecting the different parts of the city along the waterfront as one whole coming together. Uh, in addition to your comments, another thing that we learned from is other places. So these are a few projects that we looked at more closely that pursued similar streetscape improvement efforts, uh, where um, we were particularly interested in, in the different types of impacts that these projects had beyond uh, you know, our basic kind of uh, primary goal of improving street safety for, for all different types of users. So starting in St. Louis, Missouri, 
um, the city invested in a six block section of South Grand Boulevard. Um, and the project included reducing the overall width of the road in favor of more sidewalk space, as well as increasing the overall planted area and tree canopy. As a result of that investment, um, they saw a reduction of heat island effect, reduction of noise level uh, that's associated with traffic, with heavy traffic, and an increase in uh, annual sales tax revenue in the surrounding area around uh, the, the, where the project was implemented. In Lincoln, Nebraska, a similar scale project, the city invested in uh, a streetscape project that connects four different neighborhoods in the downtown area. Um, this included reducing the number of traffic lanes, shortening the crossing distance using curb extensions. Uh, so that's, uh, we have an image of that on the next slide. Uh, and then reducing the um, overall lane width and increasing bicycle parking. So as a result of this project, and this is the kind of uh, curb extension that shortens uh, crosswalk or crossing distances for pedestrians. So as a result, the project um, significantly improved the perception of safety for many pedestrians. So that's something that we care a lot about, not only the um, statistics that show number of uh, traffic crashes, but also how safe do people feel when they walk or bike down the street. Um, the project uh, actually reduced the electricity consumption uh, of buildings along this corridor, uh, and then um, finally reduced uh, increased property values and reduced vacancy rates on the ground floor of uh, the street front properties. Uh, what's special about this project in, uh, in Houston, in Texas, it's a little bit longer, it's um, uh, 12 blocks long, is the investment that um, they, they focused on green infrastructure. So in, in addition to reducing the overall street width, the project added 14,000 square feet of rain gardens for stormwater management. And this allowed them to capture and treat a significant amount of stormwater, uh, reduce the pavement temperature, uh, which is critical in, in Houston as much as it is in Pensacola. Um, now, in our site on Main Street, we have uh, some significant site constraints, and David will speak a little bit about that, uh, where um, we can accommodate stormwater management features, but we're still trying to do that as much as we can. So you'll notice many of these projects have um, economic benefits in addition to safety, stormwater, and other considerations. So with that, I would like to um, hand the mic over to James Lima, uh, who will talk a little bit more about the economics of Great Streets. Over to you, James. Okay, we'll have a little trouble getting unmuted. Good evening, so good to see everyone. Thank you, Lee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, back talking about beautiful waterfront in, in Pensacola and the importance of investing in great streets. And it's maybe not so obvious that there's an economic aspect to, to great streets, but there are so many ways that great streets and great places um, are really beneficial to the communities at large, but particularly to all aspects of economic, social uh, well-being. So uh, let me just give you a quick intro, and then my colleague, Yushan Law, will walk you through some case studies. Uh, what are some of the benefits of, of good streets? Um, from a business and, and real estate point of view, pedestrians, cyclists, and transit riders generally spend more money at local retail businesses than people who drive cars underscoring the importance of offering attractive, safe places for transit riders, pedestrians, and cyclists. Great streets have also been shown to add real property value in neighborhoods. Health and human lives are positively affected by better designed streets because they relieve mental and physical stress. They lower medical expenses than the need for social services. And work and productivity. Um, 
significant numbers of our uh, worker hours are lost as a re result of time spent in traffic congestion. Not to mention the fact that there are um, more uh, pedestrian injuries and fatalities attributable to poorly designed streets that of course have an enormous uh, social and economic cost. Uh, construction and maintenance, uh, narrower streets cost less to build and maintain. And if you use high quality materials that are durable, you can, can significantly reduce maintenance costs over the life of the project. Green alleys and streets and tree plantings are estimated to be three to six times more effective in managing stormwater runoff. And so reduce the need for hard infrastructure investments. So those are just a few ways that a great street is good business sense and provides all kinds of uh, positive returns on public investment. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Yushan Law. Thank you. Thank you, James. Next slide, please. All right, so to take a deeper look at how the economic benefits of good streets come into place in real life, let's review more case studies. We have four examples in total. The first example we're looking at is from Dubuque, a city with population of 58,000. So as you can see in the table on the slide, similar to the hashtag project, which we're gonna be looking at after this, the streetscape improvement project in Dubuque did not affect the traffic lanes and added new bike lanes, as well as a better design um, features for the street. Next page. So the economic impact of the improvement in Dubuque mainly comes from the new private investment that follows. So similar to the goal that Lee has shared earlier about trying to encourage new infill and retail development, these actually happen in Dubuque. So three years after the project, developers and businesses have invested $34 million into the district, which enjoys a lot of success because of the pedestrians and cyclists, they spend more time and money in the area. So in the photo, you can see an example of how the public realm was activated in the district. And as a result of the increased investment and more intensive use, the property value in this place has more than doubled in the three year period after that. Next page. So this next example comes from Lodi, a place of 65,000 residents. As you can see in the table and the pictures, the improvement was mainly for design features and street trees and the economic impacts comes from these design features positive effect on the local businesses and retailers. Next page. So in a nutshell, the project is a job creator in Lodi. So during the eight year time frame after the project was implemented, 60 new businesses were tracked in the downtown area. As a result, I mean, as a further evidence of the vibrancy in downtown, the vacancy rate also dropped from 18% to 6% in the same time period. This is ultimately beneficial to the city and the city's provision of public services as the sales tax revenue went up by 30% during that eight year period. We then come to uh, Lee's summit in Missouri. So in this place, as you can see, the intervention was mainly about design treatment and traffic calming, and the economic benefit is directly related to jobs and businesses. Next page. So as you will see um, in the numbers on the left, in the seven years after the project implementation, 10 new businesses and 58 new jobs have been created in downtown. And the new private investment totaled $3.5 million in the same period in the small area of the small town. Uh, next page. According also to interviews and news published in the same time period, Local business owners in Lead Summit, they felt that the improvement can make the downtown a more attractive place to visit, which will help businesses. And for residents, the new improvement is also a source of excitement, which can encourage more people to come here again and again. 
Next page. Right, so this is our last example. We want you to show some specific cases about bike lanes and how they can yield economic dividends to downtown businesses. So here we have two examples from streets in San Francisco and Seattle, where the bike lanes were installed to encourage more cycling. Uh, next page. These bike lanes are very important economic assets for the city, regardless of the size, because cyclists and pedestrians, they are slower. They are a slower form of traffic, as James mentioned earlier, which means that these group of people, they can spend more time in their movement. And therefore, they are more likely to visit the shops and spend money there. And also, improved design features also make the place more attractive and beautiful. So even if the street is not a part of people's daily commute, more people, especially the younger folks, they will feel like to come here for a walk or photography, and that can benefit local businesses as well. And when the downtown is more successful, the entire city's economy and tourism in particular will benefit. So as you can see from examples, after San Francisco bike lane project was implemented, two thirds of the merchants felt it had a definitely positive impact on sales. And in Seattle, the restaurant employment went up by 30% within just one year as a result of the slower traffic bringing more people and those people spending more time and money there. So this is the end of our case study section. Uh, with that, we'll hand over to the design team. Thank you, Yusheng and James. This was definitely very informative. Um, I'm sure at this point, we're all eager to see what, what we have planned for Main Street. Um, so for your reference, this is a sketch that we had developed for the framework plan that had, had envisioned a, a two-way bicycle uh, traffic lane along the south side of uh, Main Street with an increase in overall planting, uh, both on the sidewalk and in the median, uh, and anticipating some future commercial development. So with that, I'll hand it over to David Tiller, uh, who will walk you through the update des updated design based on the opportunities and constraints that uh, the, the physical site presented to the team uh, and building on the comments that, um, that we received from the last public meeting. Thank you, Lee. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, share my screen. And um, and it's not letting me. There we go. So I'd like to start off with a uh, tour. Um, Dewberry flew Main Street just to give you guys a tour of where we are in the world. Um, we're starting off here at Alconies and Main Street over Bartram Park. And so just to give you a sense of the existing conditions of Main Street and what we're talking about here, we're gonna hit play. We flew this in our drone in uh, the spring of 2020. Uh, it gives you a great sense of the traffic conditions at this time. And I will advise this is before the bridge. So the traffic is as it is. Um, we have uh, you know, overhead utilities. We have Bartram Park here to the west or to the left. Um, and we're going west on Main Street. Um, as we go down, you'll see different things such as ADA crosswalks or crosswalks for pedestrians, some landscaping, uh, different features. We have uh, the port entrance here to the left, uh, a large underground power substation here. Uh, approaching Tarragona, coming up further in, you can see the traffic condition and the queuing up and you can see the, the parking and the commercial vehicles. And uh, if you wait for it, you'll see uh, one of the issues we have with this project, three, two, one. There he is, cyclists going down the wrong way of Main Street. Coming here to Jefferson, uh, coming here to the Bank of Pensacola, coming here to Palafox. This video is before Alfresca was completed. And as we come here down past Bodacious and into the Bodacious Brew, uh, the project limits, we're, we're gonna stop here at Balin. And as this large tractor trailer stops here on Balin, I'm gonna stop the video right about there. And uh, those are the existing conditions that uh, Dewberry was uh, scoped to work with. And so I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and bring you into our virtual uh, meeting room here. And we're gonna use a uh, product called Miraboard. And I'm 
think I'm sharing the wrong screen there. Apologies. Lee, are we seeing the mirror board or are we seeing the video? We're seeing your desktop. Oh. How about now? There we go. There we Perfect. go. So this is our meeting room and um, we're gonna come in here. We're gonna start here to the uh, top corner here. So Dewberry was contracted by the city of Pensacola and with the uh, SCAPE documents that we were handed in 2019, coming up with a phasing plan. And it's very similar to what we were just shown from, uh, from Lee's documents. Phase one is the revitalization of Main Street from Alkanese to Balin Street. Phase two is the revitalization of Cedar Street from Bartram Park to Spring Street. And again, phase three is the extensions of North and South from the waterfront all the way to an intensia. So those are the, the hashtag components that Lee mentioned, and that was our scope of work. And we're currently contracted to do phase one. We, we've kind of decided with the city that this is low hanging fruit. This is what's most attainable in the hashtag project right now. So we've done some conceptual planning, uh, field work, geotechnical investigations, topographic survey, um, working with ADA, looking at observations, public safety access, working with uh, fire access through intersections, and then conducting bi-weekly stakeholder meetings with city departments, and as well as not only the city departments you see here, but other stakeholders, such as UWF Historic Trust, uh, ECUA, Gulf Power, FDOT, CSX, and trying to get a gamut for everybody involved with this project. Going back to the, the project description and some of the goals that Lee mentioned, you know, the hashtag project is that catalytic project that enhances its economic development brings citizens to the water and connects that east-west continuous waterfront trail. So to take you some of the project progression and concepts we explored, we started with the SCAPE documents back in 2019 that had the two bike lanes on the south side of Main Street and working with, uh, you know, trying to incorporate as many bioretention systems as we can, greening of islands, uh, greening of improving the sidewalk conditions, and trying to fit everything in that we possibly could in a, in a streetscape here. So we, we, took some, we took some comments. We originally went through and put together the last public documents that everybody has seen is the conceptual plans from 2019, which does not have the protected bike lanes. We were incorporating the bioretention cells, the parking, some of the colonnade of trees down Main Street, but to make the bike lanes work, we were running into some roadblocks. And I'll talk about that a little bit, but this is a concept that was passed and things we we're exploring. And it went all again from Balin to Alkanes. So that leads us to where we are today in our concept exploration and where we are. And I'd like to invite you to the main table of where we are. And this is the design in schematic and that where we, where we think it satisfies the requirements of the design intent, as well as makes it work and fits everything within the city. Uh, city limits here. So I'm going to start you here just, just east of Balin, showing you the concepts. Um, we have two protected bike lanes on east and west Main Street. Um, we have protected islands in the center, uh, green and uh, vegetated. Um, the trees that we're selecting here for the model here are, are, are just placeholders. We're looking at the landscaping proposed, as well as, you know, lighting conditions and looking at things like that. Um, this is a complete streets project, and when you say complete streets, that's not just bicyclists and, and pedestrians. That is pedestrian vehicles, commercial vehicles, over-the-road vehicles, and, you know, we have to pay attention to that. So one of the features of our design is trying to squeeze everything in here with the five-foot lanes, the protected islands, reducing the lanes to 11 feet, and then trying also to accommodate everything else. So right here uh, between uh, Bodacious and uh, Balin here, you'll see a condition where it's protected on the north side of Main Street, and then it's a shero condition. And that's something where the, the limits of right-of-way, uh, as you know, Pensacola is a very old city, and so the right-of-way doesn't exactly line up nice in a nice even grid. It, it's it's a little, little problematic as you go block to block. And so we're having to work with that and squeeze things in. Um, this section here in the center is a place for commercial vehicles. First commercial vehicles, a different texture. It's going to be striped where 
uh, trucks can offload and service the restaurants, the surrounding areas here. Uh, we do have some amenities along the way. We do have parking, we have access to entrances and we have maybe bicycle storage, uh, maybe some benches, that sort of thing. We're actually moving forward with that. Um, going to the accesses, if you notice as we go through the design here, we're not cutting off accesses to uh, private properties here. That was needed to be kept open, which kind of the double lane and the earlier concepts wouldn't work as well as some concerns with traffic movements of pedestrians and cyclists. As we come here to Palafox Street, you'll notice the crosswalks are better realigned to the tangent points of the curves of the street. The streets bump out a little more. As the streets narrow to 11 foot lanes, it gives us more opportunity to do that. Um, that those, re, those crosswalks will, will be redone in the uh, pattern that the public works likes, the, the stamped asphalt, maybe red brick, um, keeping a consistent project across throughout the, throughout the entire project limits. One thing that's new to Pensacola are bike boxes. I say new, new to Main Street. Uh, those are the big green squares where pedestrians, and, or, sorry, cyclists traveling west will pull here and then if they want to turn, they will go south and follow the traffic to the share of conditions. One of the things we're paying attention to is the future plans for phases two and three where cyclists are gonna be traveling south on Palafox in a share of condition and north on Jefferson in a share of condition and trying to move those cyclists and pedestrians safely across these intersections is, is problematic. And we believe what we have here is the design that accommodates that. We do have islands here again, as we move from Palafox to Jefferson. Um, one thing about the sidewalk conditions, and when I talked about the distance of right of way, some buildings protrude out, some buildings are gonna, we're gonna have to maybe modify. This, this large landscaping bed is kind of a placeholder as I think we need more sidewalk condition in front of uh, the art museum. And that, that, uh, uh, the cyclist path will probably curve out and curve back in as it enters this uh, service entrance here. Um, as we come to Jefferson here, you'll notice on the south side of Main Street, um, and let me back up, as you know, the history of Pensacola, Main Street is the original shoreline for Pensacola. Everything south of Main Street is infill. And so one of the things we're trying to pay attention to in this project is the historical components of the, uh, of the project and paying attention to that working waterfront and trying to have features and amenities along the project that pay tribute to that. So we have a sinuous screen wall here, um, just south of Main Street here between the Bank of Pensacola and Jefferson to sort of hide a parking lot, but also give us an opportunity to uh, maybe have some historical markers, so historical signage, some amenities that again, pay tribute to that working waterfront. As we move forward to Jefferson Street here, we have something that's new, uh, it's not there today, and that's a signalized intersection. This is something where our team worked on it. We, we looked at different concepts and to get cyclists safely across Jefferson and north on Jefferson in a share of condition, it's, it's, it's the benefits of having a signal that has intersection are, are what we're working towards. We're currently trying to get scope to do a uh, traffic signal warrant study for this intersection so that we can justify the requirement for need and the need of the signalized intersection here. Um, as we move past uh, Jefferson, we're coming uh, to Little Theater. You know, there's a lot of uh, donors, donor plaques here for both the museum and Little Theater. We're going to be removing those and, and putting those back in the sidewalk condition here. Um, and to that sidewalk condition, if you may notice, it's, it's a little grainy in this image, but we do have a gray strip here along the, the um, tree boxes here. That's a linear ADA paver. So for ADA, ADA accessibility, having that lineal directional paver as you uh, walk and navigate the street, that's gonna be a feature there that's uh, inlaid into the uh, sidewalk condition. And we may also have some uh, inlays in the sidewalk condition that again, pay tribute to the working waterfront of maybe the water line back in the early 1500s or 1600s, that's where it was. And maybe we could show that in a way. Um, more islands, uh, again, access to dumpster areas, access to um, hotel access here for the Holiday Inn. And uh, as we come over here, we, we stopped our model here before you get to Tarragona. But I want to remember, uh, remind everybody when we watched the drone video, you remember seeing, uh, seeing the guy on the bicycle going the wrong way. We decided to capture that image and then overlay and superimpose our model onto that. And I'll, I'll take you to that exhibit here we have. And this is that, that image where we had the, uh, the cyclist going the wrong way. This is an isometric of what the, uh, this design would look like looking west down Main Street. So again, you can see the signalized intersection of Jefferson, 
the green striping of uh, cyclist traffic, the bike boxes, the landscaped islands, and again, that sinuous wall along between uh, Powell Fox and Jefferson on the south side. Again, protected lanes on the east and west, and uh, again, the, the linear gray uh, ADA accessibility pavers. Um, and then looking to the north, you can see the, the, the uh, parking area for commercial vehicles to offload. At this time, what I'd like to do is stop sharing my screen here and take you to a flyby video of the model. It gives you a better perspective of it and maybe real time here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And I'll try again. Lee, help me out. Are we seeing the video? Yes, we're seeing the video. Go for okay, it. Okay, here we go. So again, we're leaving uh, the Tarragona area and coming up to uh, Jefferson. Uh, as you can see, we have the protected bike lanes on the on the eastbound and westbound side. Uh, as much parking as we can achieve and still satisfy the needs here. Uh, the signalized intersection, if you notice, we have. Uh, lights for the uh, cyclists in each lane, as well as the bike boxes and the uh, the crossings. Um, coming up here, this the buildings that you see here are not mass to scale. It's what's available. So uh, if you look at the streets, I'll kind of guide you as we come to intersections here. Um, we do have the sinuous wall here between Palafox and Jefferson. I was I was referencing, and then moving forward, we have you know islands and uh, museum here. Coming up to Palafox. Here at Palafox, we have Bank of Pensacola to the left. And uh, again, Alfresco was under construction at the time we had the aerial images, but this is Bodacious Brew here and we're crossing Palafox right now. And coming into the, again, the condition where I was talking about where commercial vehicles maybe need to service restaurants. And then we stop here right at, uh, at Balin and uh, the model stops. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen here and bring you back to the Miro board. There we go. And so this time, Leah, I'll turn it over to you if you want to talk about breakout tables. Yes, so first of all, thank you, David. That was super helpful. Okay. Um, uh, I, before we break uh, and, and we, we might take a few questions uh, before that. Um, I, I wanted to turn the tables a little bit uh, around and, and ask a few questions of our participants. Um, so these are just things that we would like you to consider. And if you have any thoughts, you know, drop them in the chat or contact us after the meeting. Um, so first and foremost, what we're looking to hear from you about is, um, does the update, updated design that uh, David just walked us through create a safer environment along Main Street, primarily for pedestrians and cyclists, but we're also obviously concerned in, in the, the service level for, for drivers. Um, so that's that's our, our first one, the, the kind of safety and comfort of use. Um, is, in your view, is the project creating a better connection between the east and west of Pensacola. So thinking back to some of the comments that we got last time. And then finally, um, you know, what would you like the team to consider as they develop the design further? So this could be anything from um, accessibility, which is obviously very much on our minds, uh, to local history, to uh, native trees and plant species, uh, places to sit, shade, parking, anything like that. Uh, so this is our prompt uh, to you for, for thoughts, for comments, and, and general questions. Uh, now, before we break into the smaller rooms, uh, there are a few questions that we received in the chat that I think we could uh, maybe discuss as a larger group right now. So I'm, with that, I'm going to um, ask Jess, who's been receiving the questions, to read one or two for us, sure. if you will. 
Okay, so I have, I think this is one good question. So during the time since the council created funding for the approved projects of Hashtag and Bruce Beach, it is likely that costs have increased for construction. Is there any additional funding sources to not only do phase one at an excellent level, but also funds for the future phases? Doing this at a world-class level is important as the waterfront defines the city to visitors and holds so much potential for improved quality of life for our residents. So I would direct that to uh, either the city or the CRA, if we could have a participant to um, volunteer to respond. I don't know if we still have Mayor Robinson with us or Helen Gibson. I'm sorry, I forgot to, I was trying to mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I would just like to say that we hope that there may be opportunity for other funds to come our way, either through uh, grants or working with the DOT and or uh, just increased uh, revenues from uh, that result from the benefits, so um, from the project. So we hope that there will be revenues down the road to do some additional things. Lee, um, I simply thank you again. I, I, I think it, it looks great. We know there are going to be, we, we knew there were def some deficiencies going in. We are going to, we've been waiting for this to get a total together. We want to go together to um, take this and go to, um, Triumph Gulf Coast with uh, with some stuff. We've I think we've got eighteen point four million. Is that correct, Helen? Was what we what we had eighteen point two. Um, and we want to take that and ask Triumph to put in uh, you know uh, match that eighteen point four um, and and do it in a way that will also include some stuff we want to do at the port, so that we think we can show what we can do with job creation, uh, both from the hashtag. Bruce Beach and the improvements that we that we make at the port. So that would be roughly 37 million uh, that we would have. So we we you know we, we we do think there's an opportunity for us to put more funding into it, and we will go from there. Obviously, we think uh, Main Street is probably our most um, important corridor, and uh, that's certainly where we want to start. But we believe all the other corridors are just as important, and we do have a plan to uh, create funding for some of that. Thank you. I think we can do maybe one more question before breaking out into smaller groups. I have a question here that we can that I can read out. Um, this is a clarification, probably for you, David. Um, are bicycles going to have to merge into uh, to merge left into traffic? heading west on Maine when reaching Palafox. That doesn't seem very uh, necessarily safe or comfortable. Can we maybe walk through the, what the circulation, yes. the bike circulation would be? Yeah, and then that is the one condition where we have a, uh, a cyclist move, moving into a shared condition here after he crosses Palafox moving west. Or she. And uh, I'm sharing my screen, right? I think I am. Yes. Yeah, okay, so that is the one condition of a Shero where we simply do not have the real estate to add a protected bike condition at this location between Palafox and before it opens up uh, right away wise to get there. So we have some we have some things here regarding, you know, uh, some of the, the building here. We have gas meters, water meters, uh, traffic control boxes, some utilities that prevent kind of accessing some of the sidewalk condition here. But at the same time, we just don't have the real estate to move everybody around this corner. So one of the reasons we looked at doing this, and again, we looked at uh, bike lanes protected on the south side, bike lanes protected on the north side. Our initial concept was no protected bike lane sharing, share roads all on both sides. And uh, when you add everything up, this is the best condition. And this is one of the sacrifices that we have to make 
in this one area here to make this function and tie to existing city infrastructure. You know, one thing that's not shown here on the model is the connection over here to the Sharrows west of Balin. You know, those traffic movements uh, in any other condition are, are not safe. So having the protected lanes on north and south make it more conducive and safer as you leave this improved condition on the west side of the project. And on the east side of the project, and we can talk about this in the breakout session, uh, and Lee, I don't, I don't know if you mind, I'm gonna show my the, the model condition up here. Uh, the condition of, of these protected lanes going west of how they have to cross Balin. And this is a, a further explore of the, uh, of the model here. Um, and then the aerial image is, is off on this for some reason, but Tarragona is here. And then we have a protected lane to the north and a share of condition as you leave uh, Bartram Park. And the uh, share of condition enters into Bartram Park right here, but we've obviously got a, uh, a the image has, has re repeated itself here. So we might just take that off in discussion here. Um, does that answer the question? I think so. I think, I mean, the bottom line is that um, little piece of Maine just west of Palafox is yeah. where, really where we're most constrained in terms of the, the roadway environment and just don't have enough space to continue the physical, the physically protected, uh, physically separated bike lane. Yeah. But like throughout the, the rest of the project, wherever we are able to make that space, yeah, it's, it's a balance between every aspect of pedestrian, cyclist, vehicular, and you know, commercial vehicle safety is implemented holistically across the project to make sure that we're trying to, to capture everything. And just an example, you know, the stop bar here at Jefferson, you know, this is not ideal to have a, have a crosswalk behind the stop bar that way. However, the sight distance here between this existing structure we're bringing that forward so you can at least see the vehicles coming. And now with the signalized intersection, Jefferson becomes much safer. And another point to make is the traffic here with the 11 foot lanes and the, the streetscaping, traffic is going to slow down on Main Street dramatically. Um, it's not gonna be the screaming at 45 miles an hour until you hit Tarragona and then try to slow down. Uh, you're gonna be slowing down well before that. Um, and the signalized intersection at Jefferson is going to be, uh, I think, a, a very warranted signal. Mm -hmm. So one last question, David, I think before we split up, um, there's a request to um, explain the, uh, the bike box concept, concept with a cyclist out front. Yes. Uh, the bike box concept, you know, that is... Uh, gosh, my kid just took his learner's test, and yeah, that's in the in the state regs here for bike boxes. Um, this is, you know, this is the standard practice for cyclists to go into an intersection, pull in front of the traffic here, and 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 then be able to have that space solely dedicated for cyclists. And so, just in this example of Palafox, if that cyclist in the complete streets design manual and with F dot design manuals. If they need to turn left, they will pull into this bike box and work their way here into the left lane in the bike box and then proceed south. Or they can go straight across the lane here. Um, that, that is the standard practice. If you notice, there's no bike box here on Palafox because this is a share condition. So the bike box is not needed or required on the share condition going south on Palafox, but it is, it is needed here as it is on Jefferson. If you're gonna turn north on Jefferson, you are going to get in the, come here and get in the bike box and follow traffic into the shared condition of Jefferson Avenue. If you notice, there's no bike box here to turn south on Jefferson because in the grand plan, master plan for pedestrian and cyclists, cyclists are not really to go south on Jefferson. We're encouraging, and with the city going to be encouraging cyclists to travel north on Jefferson and south on Palafox. And so those bike boxes are, are needed to make those traffic movements safely. Thank you, David. So with that, I think we can um, uh, switch over to our smaller group discussions. Um, I, so I would, uh, before we do that, just uh, back to housekeeping, I would also like to remind everyone that there will be, uh, th for those of us, uh, of you who are interested, there will be an in-person 
open house tomorrow afternoon uh, at Maritime Park, same time, 5.30 to 7. Uh, we have some canopies. Uh, this will be in the amphitheater area, so it's covered. I know we're anticipating a little bit of rain, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, so you'll be able to meet David and his team and discuss the project further and cover any questions you might have. Um, so at this point, you, you know, you are, um, if, if you feel like this is enough, you're welcome to um, bid us farewell and go have dinner. Uh, or if you'd like to continue the discussion uh, a bit more informally, we will break into three smaller rooms. So each room has a topic. Uh, the first room will discuss complete streets, so sidewalks, bike lanes, intersections, et cetera. And that conversation will be with David, Garrett from his office, and Jessica from SCAPE. Uh, the second room will discuss infrastructure and stormwater management with Crystal from Dewberry and myself. And then the third room will discuss the economic opportunities uh, that are generated through this project um, with James and Yushang. So if you have, if you're a small business owner, if you have retail frontage, uh, if you have interest in those aspects of the project, please join the third room. So uh, 